my name is Louise Slaughter. I represent the 25th Congressional District of New York, which at this point is wholly within Monroe County, New York, which is the home of Rochester. Uh, and uh, I've had districts that stretched all the way to Buffalo. Uh, they, uh, in every redistricting, I have been a target. I've survived three. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, everybody understands that redistricting is a parlor game now, sort of a, uh, what's actually a game of power, but uh, we, we managed to survive. Uh, I have a, a degree in microbiology and a master's degree in public health from the University of Kentucky, uh, which has helped me an awful lot, although I've certainly not done anything in the healthcare field. Uh, but I do understand the germ theory of disease, uh, and, uh, and it's been very helpful, not only in the genetics, but first uh, I, I was able to uh, work with outside groups and set up the first Office of Women's Health. Uh, at the time, I was fortunate to be serving on both the Rules Committee, where I'm now ranking member, and the Budget Committee. Um, and we went through some awful time just trying to set up the Office of Women's Health. And I remember the budget committee hearing when we were putting the budget together and I said we're going to put some money in here for women's health. Uh, at that time, this was in the 90s, and I don't think people understand the early 90s, uh, that all research at the National Institutes of Health was done on white men. Now, that probably people are not going to find that really hard to countenance, which accounted for the fact that there was almost no research done on ovarian cancer, cervical cancer diseases that mainly affected women, osteoporosis, uh, no research, although we spent billions every year to treat it, to try to treat it. We now have about 16 kinds of treatments just for osteoporosis. Now breast cancer research is being done on women as well as men, and we brought in minorities, which is very important. So with the bill we wrote to set up the Office of Women's Health, we specified some things that we felt had been neglected. And we, took, we put prostate cancer in there because we cared about our men. Uh, sickle cell anemia, which had, nobody had done very much about. We wanted that research more thoroughly. Uh, and that led to the genetics bill because I was able to get that bill passed, having been on those two committees. But I remember when I first brought it up to the men on the budget committee, and I knew some of their wives had breast cancer. Uh, their comment to me was, you're asking for a quota system. And we said, well, you have a quota already. It's 100% white male. And we, uh, women are the majority of population in the United States. We work, we pay taxes, and you can't leave us out any longer because we have hormones. So I, having been successful with that, I was approached when the human genome started to be sequenced. Because we, we felt, these were women, again, we were talking to with some of the outside groups, and as well as the woman who at that point was Surgeon General, um, that we thought that it would be good if public policy, the law, kept up with science for a change, and it never happened. Uh, and we, we wanted to try to do that, but we ran into the roadblock of healthcare uh, institutions not wanting it done. Uh, we had a, a situation where, the, the first I should say that the Ashkenazi Jewish women were very instrumental in being able to do this bill at all. Their generosity was overwhelming. They were, because they, uh, they allowed themselves to be used basically for the breast cancer gene, and where we found out mostly about that. It was one of the first things that we discovered that already we understood some genetic causes for things like cystic fibrosis and individual diseases. Uh, but we, we knew we'd just not, not even scratch the surface of that great science of how we are made. Uh, in addition to everything else we've learned through genetics is that all of us are 99.99% .99 the same. Uh, I think if, if we don't come up with anything else in this world, we all know that and make everybody understand that. Uh, we could maybe have a lot better society to live in, but in any case, uh, we wanted to try to uh, do it, but doctors were telling women with breast cancer. We were losing a Vietnam wall of women every year, that same number, to death to breast cancer. But doctors were saying to them, until this genetic bill gets passed, don't get tested. And we had history from all over the place of the discrimination against people, including Livermore Labs that discriminated against persons with sickle cell anemia genes or, or disposition. 
Now, our basic premise was this for the law. All of us have bad genes. All of us have between 30 or 40 bad genes. Therefore, all of us were affected by what happened to people because of their genetic makeup. We also knew that having a gene did not necessarily intend mean that you were going to get that condition or that, or that, in that fall in that category of persons with that handicap or disability. Uh, and to discriminate against somebody in 30 or 40 years might change their life into, uh, just in some way, was the rank is kind of discrimination. And since we were all involved, including the, the people who own the health insurance companies and the drug companies as well, we tried to make the point that this is for all of us. What the law basically intended to do was make sure that your genetic information belonged to you so that you wouldn't be afraid to get the genetic testing you needed to really plan your life and know more about yourself. And second, that you couldn't lose your job because of your genetic makeup. Now, since that time, the Affordable Health Care Act has taken care of that portion to a degree because pre-existing conditions uh, no longer affect your ability to be insured. But at the time we did this, this was really quite remarkable because this, this had never come up before. Uh, and we, we found all, awful cases all over the country of discrimination. So we set out to try to do it with all great altruistic belief in the world that everybody would want it, uh, and ran into the fact we couldn't get a hearing. And um, to start off the, with the Democrats were in charge of the House, I had a wonderful co-sponsor, uh, Biggers uh, from, uh, Congressman Biggers from uh, Illinois, a Republican, who helped me. And when the Republicans were in charge, she would take the bill. And when Democrats got back, I, I, I would take it. And I certainly need to make it clear that President George Bush, H.W. H. Bush, um, was, uh, George W., sorry. I, I, need to, I messed that up. Would want to, George W. Bush had said many times that he would sign the bill, including once in the State of the Union, and he did. So I, we're very grateful to him for that. But what we found out was that, uh, and it took some doing, uh, trying to get hearings. I went through numbers of persons who were uh, chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee to try to get a hearing. But we found out that the drug companies and the health insurers did not want the bill. For one reason, they, uh, the drug companies like to go through records and find out what were the prevailing diseases and what they should do research on. And I made it clear I didn't mind if they had to, if that's what they wanted to do, but they didn't need to know who the people were or where they worked or where they lived. Um, and we had a very difficult time and we may not have ever been able to pass the bill. So when the Democrats took over in 2007 and the great Nancy Pelosi said, watch me uh, do, try to do that bill forever and was always a co-sponsor, said one of the first things we will do it's a genetic non-discrimination bill, and we did. And I had the magnificent Ted Kennedy carrying it for me in the Senate. And that is such a remarkable man. But it passed the Senate unanimously twice before we could even get a hearing over here. Um, uh, Dr. Frist, uh, at the time, who was majority leader in the Senate, was a doctor who also believed very strongly in what we were doing. Um, but it was... Uh, it was a very heavy lift, and we know that every two years, our terms are two-year terms. At the end of those two years, all legislation dies that's not been passed, which meant that every single beginning of every term, I had to go and get signatures again on that bill. And we would change it and modify it bits and pieces. Uh, and I, mostly by myself, I would collect the signatures on the floor of people who would, who would sign on to that bill again. So every two years we had struggled trying really to reach 218 persons that would co-sponsor it because 218 in the House would have given us an opportunity to go to the floor. The genetics science is the most wonderful thing in the world because it had the possibility of taking care of diseases that have plagued mankind. It will, has the possibility and, and the real hope that it will find the cure for cancer. And I have been told uh, by the new head of the Human Genome Project, Dr. Eric Green, who came over to see me, that they feel that they are very close to being able to turn off tumors genetically, which is a wonderful thing. 
But the possibility of working with genetics to relieve things that we never thought we could do, but second, to cut down on hospital stays, invasive surgeries, the, just the, the realm of the possible of having genetics. But our job in the Congress was to protect the rights of persons who needed to get the tests, who wanted to find out their genetic makeup. Like, for example, letters that we would get from persons who had Alzheimer's in their family. And they wanted to plan for their future by seeing if they carried the genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's. But they were afraid to because if their employer heard about it, they could lose their job. And if the health insurance or insurers knew about it, they could be dropped. Uh, and many, many people were. Uh, we had some of the saddest stories in the world of people who were discriminated against. But one of the worst, most jarring one was the one that took place at Livermore Labs against persons who were sickle cell anemia. Other members of Congress were not that interested in it, as to be frank about it. Uh, we always had some that were always sponsors uh, that, that did understand that. But we ran into an awful lot of members of Congress who thought we were talking about cloning. Uh, we, all kinds of ignorance and craziness, and many who just would not thwart the will of the insurers or the drug companies. And we, that was certainly, I think, the case of the chairs of the committees uh, that would not even give us a chance to have a hearing, despite the fact that we always had a, a good number of co-sponsors uh, in the House, and bipartisan co-sponsors as well. So uh, the, it was, uh, it was um, I, I seriously doubt if many people would have tried 13 years to do it. Uh, but. I couldn't turn it loose. Um, the fact was that we knew that the genetic promise, the things that we were learning, and, and most of, as we got through, we didn't have Senate sponsors at all. And Craig Venter, if you recall, was one of the persons who was working very hard on, on the sequencing, went with me to visit senators and talk about the possibility of this. And, to, and we, we understood that our part of it was really you know, the protection of the human being as they learned how to use this brand new science, which was so helpful and it showed such promise for so many things. And once we were able to finally crack that code and get through to people, it made it that much easier. Uh, but but it, was, uh, it, was, it was an uphill battle. No, no, never. I mean, I, I, as a microbiologist, and I said to you, I believe very strongly in the germ theory of disease. I think the reason that, that I did this bill was simply that I didn't want to do anything to stop this marvelous science. People were afraid to even be research subjects if the word got out uh, that they could lose their job. And, and let me assure you that this was happening nationwide. We had one railroad that we discovered was uh, taking great mass quantities of blood from some of their workers looking for a genetic link to carpal tunnel, and there isn't one. Uh, but they were trying to find it so that they, they could get out of any, uh, any liability or anything there. Um, but other people who uh, would have the gene, but as I pointed out, might never get the condition. And if they did, it would be 30 or 40 years away. And to say to them, and many of them brilliant scientists in some cases, we're sorry, we can't use you anymore. You might make our health insurance costs go up. Uh, it was, it was a really something that I felt had to be addressed, and it had to be addressed in Congress. So could you... And, oh, but I should say, if you'll excuse me, that there were states uh, that were a little bit ahead of us as, we, as the science progressed, uh, that there, some of those protections happened in some states before we could get it done here. Absolutely. It shouldn't be the luck of the draw what state you're born in, whether or not you get coverage or whether you're beneficial. We're having the same thing now, you know, with the affordable health care, and we, we've just been fighting the Hobby Lobby case. Uh, we've got a, a new bill on that because uh, uh, they, this, is a, this decision from this court is one of many that we find very distressing. Uh, because I, no matter how many times Alito tells me, I know that corporations aren't people. Francis Collins, well, I've got to tell you, that man is the most remarkable man. I'm so happy to have him the head of NIH. He is, uh, in many respects, a Renaissance man. 
but he was so wonderful all the way through and he was there every time we needed him. And one of the greatest days for us were the days that we finally got the bill passed. And we gathered up in the, in the uh, press gallery here in the house. Senator Kennedy was there. It was one of the last things I think that he did. Uh, he compared the bill to the splitting of the atom. Um, and, uh, or, or actually he said it was the Civil Rights uh, Act of this century. Uh, Francis Collins had said it was the equivalent of splitting the atom. Uh, the, the science itself, not the bill. Although, let me tell you, I felt like I had split an atom when I finally got this thing done. So what is And remember, all that time I'm doing a lot of other legislation as well. His in incredible intellect. The man was so far-seeing. He could see around corners on what we were doing with genetics. And, he, the, I did, what, and, and his great ability to transmit that to other people. I mean, he's, he's a jewel. I remember this last government shutdown, which was so awful. Do you know that we have five Nobel laureates that work for the federal government, and four of them were declared non-essential? Uh, which was one of the biggest, that was Ted Cruz's, I think Senator Cruz's gift to America, that shut down. Um, and, but it set back a lot of research, and as a scientist, I know you can't turn that off and on like a faucet. Uh, and and we were, we're losing a lot of our great scientists in this country. Francis Collins is, is a very unique person, um, and, not, and uh, we're having him at the helm there, I think, brings a lot of people into the field and wanting to work for the government because of him. Yes, well, I went out to uh, uh, NIH one day, and actually Dr. Sir Hooney was there, and he was remarkable. And he talked to, what we talked about with him, uh, to digress here a moment, as I often do, uh, was the fact that genetics and personalized medicine was so important. And he told me, Dr. Zerhuni, that 80% of the persons on Lipitor were not benefited by it because of their genetic makeup. These are the great things we're finding out, breaking through with genetics, that we can give you the specific treatment for your cancer. The kind of thing that you will respond to better because of the, your genetic makeup. Uh, so, but I went out to NIH one day, I think it was Dr. Zahuni was leaving, and they, uh, they had this trio. I think Francis Collins was on guitar, Dr. Zahuni I think was playing piano, and, and, and they were playing jazz, which brought me to another thing is that I also do the uh, arts caucus here to keep National Endowment for the Arts alive. And we've discovered, um, and they, they, uh, we haven't, University of California Davis discovered, that doctors who understand what they're hearing at stethoscope studied music. And I sat there and watched through three great scientists with their musical ability, knowing they were using both sides of the brain, which I hardly recommend for all Americans. <laughs> But the, the benefit of the fact that, uh, and, I, and I even talked to Bill Clinton once, because he was a great saxophonist, and most, if you find most successful people uh, in, in many, many fields have studied music. Um, oh, women, women scientists are really absolutely essential in, in what we've done here, only because, again, we are the majority. When I first got to Congress, you may be surprised to know that I had to do an amendment to a bill to allow women scientists at NIH to be monitor, uh, mentored, to be asked to the right meetings, and to be given grants. Um, because everybody understands that, uh, that some great scientific breakthroughs and some Nobel laureates I had uh, a female component in their study and in their work who was completely ignored. They even say that Einstein's wife was very helpful in the theory of relativity and he shared the money with her for the Nobel Prize. So, so we've known that forever, that women were trying to do the rights of women and women's rightful place in this society along with everything else that we're doing. Uh, and to, the women scientists of today really owe more than they think they do, I think, to what we were doing here in those early days of making it possible for them to do uh, good work and be recognized for it. Let me tell you something, I, I'm having the same thing now. We're trying to save eight classes of antibiotics for human beings because of the resistant bacteria now. I don't know if you saw the article yesterday in the New York Times about tuberculosis. 
Uh, and there are, we've carried this bill, I think, for about eight years through this preservation. Uh, we have over 450 outside groups, all the scientific groups supporting us. Pew Trust, uh, some major scientists have told us that in 10 years, strep throat could be fatal if we don't stop the use of, overuse of antibiotics and making them useless. So I'm, I'm accustomed to that, but in that case, I'm fighting the government, my government, the FDA and the USDA, right? So and we can't always say it was outside influence, although it may be outside influences on them. I, I really don't know about that. But all I can tell you is that we cannot stop the overuse of 80% of the antibiotics produced in the United States are fed to cattle and livestock every day, sick or not. So, for growth products, so they get fatter and get more money at market. Right, and this is this is. So why do, you know it can come from any sources, but whatever the powers that be, it depends. Uh, we, I'm sure you noticed the difference when Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House when we passed more legislation, it was considered to be the most productive Congress ever. Then we lose, and we go into 2011, and it is the worst Congress ever. We don't do anything much anymore. We pass one House bills here. And, and pray that the Senate will not take them up because we're, none of them should ever become law. Oh, it wouldn't even come to the floor today. No, it wouldn't go to committee. Right. As our, the reason I brought up the antibiotics bill is despite that again is human health for every lasting one of us, every man, woman, and child, we can't get a hearing on that. Right. You know, let me tell you something about another bill because it's very instructive. Sure. We carried a bill called the Stock Act. And it was to prohibit members of Congress and their staffs from trading on the market on information they had from here that nobody else had, right? Um, for at least four terms, six, seven years, I never had more than six co-sponsors. 60 Minutes took it up one Sunday night. I didn't even know it was going to be on. The next day, Monday, the house was in session. I was sitting on the floor. Everybody came in, rushing over to me. I signed on to your bill. Which one, I said. <laughs> we had, I think, 198 uh, co-sponsors before the next day was over. It went through both the House and Senate like a hot knife through butter, right? But it did have one piece in it. Actually, the first case is being heard now through the Stock Act. But it had one provision for a thing called political intelligence, which is worth $402 million a year and is un unregistered. Senator Lieberman took it out. Senator Grassley put it back. Came back over to the House. Eric Cantor took it out and put it on suspension calendar. And his opponent used it against him in the recent primary that he lost. This, th th these are stories that only we who are involved would tell you because we know that. But that's often the way things work. But so we passed a bill that was effortless, that everybody wanted to be on, but something that affects everybody in the world with antibiotics, uh, we can't get a hearing on. There is none. There is none. The fact is that we tried every, every two years again, and we would get more sponsors. We'd pick up three or four or five more. Uh, the, the reason we got it passed was that Nancy Pelosi became the Speaker of the House. That's it. So there was no... As I told you, the Senate had already passed it twice. So there was no kind of... No. Tipping, ah, there was no kind of tipping... No, there was no public outcry of good to heavens protect my genetic makeup uh, ever. And as we point out, 89% of... Uh, we, some polls show 89% of physicians, practicing physicians, are not aware of this bill. Relief. Relief. And, and so happy, uh, we had not had, uh, Senator Kennedy was a, a giant of a man. Uh, and to have him carrying that bill in the Senate was, was a great honor for me. Uh, and he just was extraordinary in every way. Um, so the, when that came out as the Kennedy slaughter bill, it was pretty remarkable. But it, we never had a problem in the Senate, however. They were, uh, even under the Republicans, they passed it. Almost unanimously every time. I think there was one person who voted against mm -hmm. it. We had, uh, uh, I think when we finally got it through the House, we got very few no votes. 
So, in so fact, all he had to ever have done, I think, was to get it to the floor. Well, there are a couple things that I'm proud of. One is I've got an extraordinary staff. Uh, and, and we work hard, we work really hard, but we were able to pass this, this bill uh, with Republicans in charge. That's not happening yet now. Um, but if I were to rank things, I, I don't know exactly what I'd have to say that when I talk about saving 16,000 servicemen in Iraq, that ranks very high in my book. Um, the gene is very good. If I can save some antibiotics, that's going to be pretty wonderful. But you know, the nicest thing is that the members of Congress do these things, and nobody will ever know my name, but they may benefit from the work that we've done. And that's what counts. Right. And we, have, we have the chance here. Those of us who are lucky enough to be sent here by our neighbors, we have the chance here to make it better. And that's, that's all we can ask for, is to be able to, to do what we came to do, make it better. It's made an enormous difference. For one thing, the cost of health care is going down. We, the fact that we can cover more people. We were the only industrial country on the face of the earth that did not provide health care for our people. Uh, and it was a terrible uh, a, a handicap to international companies that they would go into uh, the, their, their corporations didn't have to worry about health care bill. But most Americans got their health care through their employers. Uh, frankly, if I'd had my choice, I would rather have gone to single payer. Uh, that would have made a lot more sense to me. And I think we will achieve that, particularly because so many states, uh, because of the Supreme Court, remember it was Supreme Court action that said states did not have to expand Medicaid. That great Supreme Court once again here. And uh, that may help us get to single payer a little faster. It was a privilege. It was a privilege. It took a long, long time. Um, and, I, and I guess the only thing you could say that I could bring to that would be persistence. Um, and um, because in, in, as a legislator is not defeated uh, because their bill doesn't pass it, as long as they can start over the next day to try again. And as long as you're getting better at it and you get more and more people sponsored, that's what you do. Right. So yeah. that, that's basically the moral of the story right. is persistence. I think so, yeah. All right. You know. It takes a lot of, it takes more education than it should. Uh, if we had the kind of media that we had that I grew up with that did those great documentaries on Harvest of Shame about migrant workers and Night Falls in the Cumberlands and all those great things about what we were doing, we don't have that anymore. It's not an education program.